I don't know about you, but I have that mass in the stomach problem every time I eat. <laughs> Robert and Ruthie just got back from a trip. Do you have your pocket picked again? Robert? No, 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 no big pockets this trip. No, yeah. prime, no primes were good today, I know of. You <laughs> survived. Well, I heard, I heard about a guy who uh, had his pocket picked. Um, he was getting ready to travel abroad, and several people told him to watch out for pickpockets, especially when, in the, when he went into the subway, mm -hmm. where you had yours yeah. picked. Yeah. And uh, if he went down into the crowded subway, a pickpocket might grab his wallet, get on the train, the doors would close, pickpocket would be gone. So he determined to be very careful. But one evening, after arriving in the city, he was dressed casually in a sport coat, and he came to the crush of people down in the subway. And sure enough, just about the time the door opened and some people were pouring in, a fellow bumped into him, and he thought, that was strange. So he reached into his pocket, and he didn't find his wallet. Well, he grabbed this fellow's coat as the door was closing, and he yanked it off the man. And finally, he got the coat off, and uh, even though the man was struggling, the door closed, and the fellow looked bewildered as the subway drove off. Well, the man thought that he got his wallet back, but when he looked in the coat, his wallet was gone. But the story has a happy ending because when he went back to his hotel, he found his wallet on his dresser. <laughs> <laughs> so, so much for introduction. <laughs> We'll get into the book of Revelation. So I invite you to turn in your Bibles. You'll need a Bible if you come to this class because we're going to take it, take a very careful look at it. <clears throat> and uh, the 19th verse of the first chapter is really. I believe, a key to understanding the book of Revelation. <clears throat> Verse 19 says, Therefore, write the things which you have seen, the things which are, and the things which will take place after these things. So we have three parts to the book of Revelation, really. The things which John saw, which are in chapter 1, the things which presently existed in his day, in chapters 2 and 3, and the things which will take place after these things, uh, in chapters 4 through 22. So I think that's an outline of the book that God has given us to help us understand what he has revealed here. Uh, the first eight book verses are a prologue to the book, it's very well laid out, really, much more so than many of the books of the Bible. It has a preface, and uh, verses 1 through 3 constitute the preface to the book. The revelation of Jesus Christ. Now that's extremely important, because what this book is all about is, is about Jesus. And it is a revelation of him. And if we fail to get what this book reveals about Jesus Christ, we will fail to get what is most important in the book. Uh, the word revelation means an unveiling. Um, the Greek word is apocalypsis, which uh, you'll recognize is connected with our word apocalypse. So it's end times things mainly that are connected with Jesus Christ that are revealed here. 
but it is mainly a, re a revelation of him, which God gave him, Jesus, to show to his bondservants the things which must take place, and he sent and communicated it by his angel or his messenger to his bondservant, John. This is the Apostle John, who was uh, is well known to us, wrote the Gospel of John, the Epistles of John, uh, one of the three closest disciples to the Lord, who testified to the Word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, everything that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads. That's a rather unique statement in Scripture, because uh, not every book includes a blessing to those who read it. But this one does. And who hear the words of the prophecy, that is, who pay attention to it, <laughs> and keep the things which are written in it. So this is a, a call to us to listen to what God has revealed, to pay attention to it, and to respond to it appropriately. For the time is near. Now, that's a relative term, of course. Some of the things that are in this book are very close to us in, times of, in, in terms of nearness. Uh, other things are re more remote, and uh, we'll get into that as we go along. Uh, a man named uh, Gerald Beasley Murray wrote, A revelation of the end of history is given, not for the satisfaction of curiosity, but to inspire living in accordance with the reality unveiled. And uh, that's going to be our emphasis as we study the book of Revelation in these uh, few weeks that we have together. Uh, it ought to affect the way we live not just the way we think. And my prayer is that it will in all of our cases. So the subject of the book of Revelation is Jesus Christ. Verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ. And we'll find that it reveals his person, who he is, his power, the tremendous power that Jesus Christ has that he's going to put into effect in this world in a way that he has never done before and his program for the future. This book makes sense if we simply understand it like we understand the rest of scripture and uh, recognize that there are a lot of figures of speech in it, but there are a lot of plain statements of fact too. And as we go through it, we're going to try and uh, understand the program that the Lord has for us as well. Verses 4 through 6 um, give the address and doxology to the book. John, who is the writer, this is the Apostle John, who we're all familiar with, to the seven churches that are in Asia. Now, uh, these are churches that I've outlined, that I've marked with the arrows here. Um, Asia Minor is that section of modern Turkey. And you'll notice that it uh, begins down here to Ephesus, Smyrna, and goes down this way to Laodicea. These are the seven churches referred to in this verse. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before the throne, his throne. Now that's of course a revelation of the eternal God. And specifically of Jesus Christ. Who is, who was, and who is to come. And from the mediating spirits through whom this revelation came. We'll, we'll read as we go along in the book of spirits uh, mediating revelation and giving 
more insight to John, who wrote the book, the Apostle John, and from Jesus Christ, verse 5, the faithful witness and firstborn of the dead. Jesus Christ is the witness of these things. He testifies to their truthfulness. And he is the one who is the first to be raised from the dead. So he knows all that's coming. And the ruler of the kings of the earth. We'll find as the book goes on that uh, Jesus Christ is the one who takes his seat and rules over all the kingdoms of the earth when he returns to this planet for a thousand years. To him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. That's an encouraging word, isn't it? This revelation is given by one who loves us and who has forgiven us our sins by his blood. His blood being, of course, a metaphor for his death. And he made us into a kingdom, priests to his God and Father. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. So that's the, uh, the doxology that uh, John gave as he introduced what God gave him to share with us. Then in verse 7, we have the theme of the book explained. Behold, he is coming. This goes back to Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. Daniel wrote, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he came up to the Ancient of Days, that is, God the Father, and was presented before him. So this is an allusion, an allusion back to the book of Daniel, and we'll find that there are many connections between what God gave John in the book of Revelation and what he gave Daniel in the book of Daniel. So this is an appropriate study for us in view of what we're studying at 11 o'clock about the book of Daniel. <coughs> Acts chapter 1 verse 9, you remember the beginning of the, the, the book of Acts begins, and after he, Jesus, had said these things, he was lifted up while his disciples were watching, and a cloud took him up out of their sight, and as they were gazing intently into the sky while he was going, then behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them, and they said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. In other words, he's going to come bodily back to heaven to earth again. And that's what John, who wrote the book of Revelation, is referring to here in verse 7 when he says, Behold, he is coming. Jesus Christ is coming back to the earth with the clouds. He went up into heaven with clouds and uh, his disciples couldn't see him because of, he vanished in the clouds. He's coming back with clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. In other words, his enemies will see him as well, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So, so it is to be, amen, or so be it. So this is a great uh, assurance that Jesus Christ is going to return to the earth. Everyone is going to see him. And uh, those on the earth will mourn over him because most of them will realize that they have not trusted him accepted him 
and so his appearance will be bad news for them. Um, did you know that the largest type that is used in newspapers is called second coming type? <laughs> and it's because it's recognized as the most important thing in history. Occasionally that type has been used for other events, like the assassination of President Kennedy, like the landing on the moon, and other things like that that are really earth-shaking events. And uh, so when Jesus Christ comes back to the earth, everybody is going to know about it. Um, we can understand how that could be today with uh, modern technology and television. Um, I understand that, well, I'll, I'll mention that later. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. This is the divine confirmation of the truth of what God revealed to John in the immediately preceding verses. Alpha and Omega, of course, are the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet, and they are often used symbolically to describe the beginning and the end of something. So he is the beginning of creation. He is the end of all things. He is uh, the Lord God, the Master God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Eternal Son of God and the Almighty One. We're going to find plenty of evidence in this book that God is mighty. We're going to read things that he is going to do when he returns that uh, demand an almighty person. And John, right out of the box here, helps us to appreciate the fact that Jesus Christ is the almighty one. Verses 9 through 11 give us the first commission that John received to, re to record the vision that God gave him concerning the future. I, John, your brother and fellow participant in the tribulation and kingdom and perseverance in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos, Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Uh, the Isle of Patmos is down there on the lower left I've highlighted with the arrow. It's a little island off the coast of what is now modern Turkey in the Aegean Sea. And John was sent there uh, because of his testimony for Jesus Christ. Um, he, he lived during the time of the Emperor Domitian, the Roman Empire Emperor who was hostile to Christians. And so uh, John's exile there, he was not uh, locked up, but he was uh, exiled to this island to keep him out of the mainstream of things by the Emperor Domitian. And uh, it is from that island called Patmos that he gives us what we have in the book of Revelation. He describes himself as the fellow participant in the tribulation and kingdom and perseverance in Jesus. Now this is not a reference to the great tribulation or the messianic kingdom that is going to be established on earth when Jesus Christ returns to this planet. It's simply a reference to general tribulation and God's overruling kingdom which has been in place forever, and to the perseverance in Jesus. Um, throughout the New Testament, we read of the importance of persevering in the faith. And in one sense, perseverance is guaranteed to every believer because our salvation is secure. There's nothing that we can do to separate ourselves from the love of Christ 
Uh, we're all going to heaven once we believe in Jesus, regardless of whether we continue to follow him faithfully or not. Uh, uh, salvation is a work of God that he performs that will assure us of going to heaven. But perseverance is something that not all Christians engage in day by day. Some Christians are not faithful to the Lord in their daily living. Others are. And of course, this revelation is, that, is designed to help us to persevere, to press on. There's nothing like a knowledge of the future that helps us live in the present. That's one of the great values of studying the book of Revelation. It helps us to see how things are going to play out, and that gives us hope. That gives us a desire to live for the Lord now because we know that the future is great in view of what he has revealed. John was in the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. This is a satellite view of the island of Patmos and tradition has identified a place where John received this book by vision, the cave of the apocalypse. And uh, there's a monastery that's been built there. If, if you've gone to the Bible lands, you know they build a monastery over any important site that's ever mentioned in the Bible. Well, there's one here on the island of Patmos to commemorate St. John. The red is a, is a road on the modern island there, and often uh, visitors go there. Anybody? Been to this island on, on a cruise, perhaps? Okay. Have you? No, just, just close. close. Okay, close by. Yeah, we said it because of the turkey that we were allowed to land and had that bombing. Oh, okay. You don't land. All right, John goes on, verse 10. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Now this phrase, in the spirit, is going to recur throughout the book, and it really means that John was caught up by the spirit of God in his thinking. Uh, a vision, of course, is, is a, a picture that somebody sees while they're awake. A dream is a picture that we see when we're asleep. So the difference between visions and dreams is really very slight. But much of what John reveals here, he saw while he was awake as God gave him supernatural insight into what was coming. This vision. And uh, the, the reference to the Lord's day here is unusual. It's the only reference in the Bible to, quote, the Lord's day, end quote. So it's not quite clear whether this is a reference to Sunday, which is how we use the term today. We talk about the Lord's Day being Sunday because the Lord rose on Sunday. Or whether it's a reference to the Day of the Lord, which is a term that is frequently used in the Bible to describe the end times. So John may be saying that this happened to him on Sunday but it's a long revelation, and he may have meant that this is a revelation that concerns this future time period that is called the Day of the Lord elsewhere in Scripture. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet saying, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Uh, so we've seen a map with those cities identified and uh, these are the letters these are the cities to which the book of Revelation was originally mailed, sent. A man named Frederick Tatford 
wrote a commentary on chapters two and three, and he titled it, The Postman from Patmos. And uh, he viewed this messenger going from John with the book of Revelation to these various churches one by one. And of course, these churches are described in chapters two and three for us. A letter to each one. <clears throat> then I turned and the voice that was speaking with me to see the voice that was speaking with me. And after turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. Well, here's a picture of a bra bronze lampstand of the time. So uh, this, that's what that looks like. And in the middle of the lampstands, I saw one like a son of man wrapped around the chest with a golden sash. clothed in a robe reaching to his feet, wrapped around the chest with a golden sa sash. His head and his hair were white, like white wool. Uh, often colors refer to specific things. Sometimes they are allusions to things. Obviously the color white is uh, a, a pure color, so often white things refer to pure things. His hair was white, pure, like wool, like snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire, piercing, able to consume with a, with a glance. You see, that's the idea. His feet were like burnished bronze, polished bronze. When it has been heated in the glow of a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters, powerful. If you've ever been to Niagara Falls, you've been impressed with the thunderous sound of that cataract as it goes over the, the cliff. And uh, that is representative of the voice of the person who is sitting on the throne that John saw in this vision. And his right hand he held seven stars and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. Now the stars are actually identified later in this chapter as the seven church, the angels of the seven churches, or the messengers of the seven churches. But the sharp two-edged sword is probably a reference to God's ability to, to bring judgment. Uh, there are several different Greek words for sword, but the one that's used here describes a large sword that was used by the Romans to cut people up. <laughs> so it's a reference to God's power to judge people. And his face was like the sun, shining in its strength. Brilliant, uh, radiating, uh, light and heat. Now this all alludes back to the book of Daniel, and you may recall these verses from our study of chapter 7 in Daniel. Daniel wrote, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming, and he came up to the Ancient of Days, and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion, honor, and a kingdom, so that all peoples, nations, and populations of all languages might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. So this ties right in with what Daniel saw, you see. Then I saw him, uh, when I saw him, John writes, I fell at his feet like a dead man. And he placed his right hand upon me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. 
the living one. And I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I, I have the keys of death and Hades. We read that uh, Jesus Christ is coming back in the previous verses. Uh, something that uh, I discovered recently that I didn't know before was that uh, Christopher Columbus wrote a book. And uh, it was entitled The Book of Prophecies. And he predicted that Jesus Christ would come back to the earth in 1636. And throughout history, there have been a lot of people who have predicted Jesus Christ's return. Uh, William Miller, the founder of Seventh-day Adventism, predicted that Jesus would come back in 1843. And then when he didn't, he predicted that he would come back in 1844. <laughs> and uh, I don't know what he did after that. <laughs> but uh, he wasn't right. Uh, lot, been a lot of attempts to uh, predict the return of Jesus Christ. The great English poet Robert Browning spoke of the worship of Christ that we read about in verse 17 in an anecdote about fellow writer Charles Lamb. It seems that Lamb, he was a great historian, and also a devoted Christian, was talking to someone about famous people and uh, people that they would like to see in the future. And Lamb said, quote, there is one other person that I would like to see. If Shakespeare were to come into the room, we would all rise up to meet him. But if that person referring to Jesus, were to come, we would fall down and try to kiss his feet and the hem of his garment. That's the difference. That's what John did. Fell at his feet like a dead man. And uh, I imagine when we see the Lord, our response is not going to be, oh, wow, I'm finally here in heaven. But it's going to be, Wow! We're going to fall down on our faces to see him just like John did. On one occasion, Michelangelo turned to his fellow artists and said with frustration in his voice, Why do you keep filling gallery after gallery with endless pictures of the one theme of Christ in weakness, Christ on the cross? And most of all, Christ hanging dead. He asked, why do you concentrate on that passing episode as if it were the last word, as if the curtain dropped down there on disaster and defeat? That dreadful scene lasted only a few hours, but to the unending eternity, Christ is alive. Christ rules and reigns and triumphs. And that's what verse 18 talks about. Jesus says, I am the living one. I was dead. Behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and of Hades. The keys being a figure for the right to control or open something. There's a book that was written called A Manual for Killing. And uh, its other title is Final Exit. And written by a man named Derek Humphreys. And it gives instructions on how to commit suicide. And early in his discussion of self-murder, Humphrey says, If you consider God the master of your fate, then read no further. <laughs> That statement raises the decisive questions. Who ultimately controls life and death? 
Do we hold the title deeds to our own person, or does God? Who decided when you were born? Do you have the right, because of pain or old age or unhappiness, to end a life we did not create? Do we, because of our faith in the Lord of life and death, refuse to talk about fate? Do we share David's trustful confidence, my times are in your hands? Do I affirm with grieving Job, even in the face of tragic loss, the Lord gave, the Lord has taken away, blessed be the name of the Lord. Meanwhile, our faith does not relieve us of responsibility for our daily tasks and duties. Instead, it strengthens us to know that God is working in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. We can therefore gladly commit the awesome decisions about life and death into his sovereign hands. I thought that was an interesting insight in view of the increasing emphasis we have today on euthanasia and uh, how we have the right to terminate either our own lives or the lives of others who don't have much quality of life anymore. Verse 20 goes on, Therefore write the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which will take place after these things. This is, I believe, the key verse, as I mentioned before, and helps us to understand what follows. As for the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels or messengers of the seven churches. Now, what are these angels of the seven churches? Well, frankly, I don't know. <laughs> angels, the word translated angels is literally messenger. So it could be a human messenger or it could be a divine messenger, an angel. It could be the pastors of these churches the messengers to the churches who bring the word of the Lord to them. It could be a divine guardian of each church. Um, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So Jesus is seen in the midst of this group in heaven as he is given this insight, this unusual view of what's going on in the heavenly realm. We have only a few other passages in scripture where we get a glimpse of what's happening in heaven and it's highly symbolic of course because it's going to be far transcendent above anything we can imagine but God is sitting on the throne, he's surrounded by beings who worship him and uh, we'll read more about this in chapters four and five, but uh, here we have an introduction to it. So uh, chapter one assures us of Jesus Christ's coming. Uh, in an article entitled the Startling Beliefs of Future Ministers, which appeared in the Red Book in 19, August of 1961, um, there was the results of a survey taken among several major denominational seminaries. Now, I want you to be clear that these were denominational seminaries, and not my seminary. <laughs> okay, this is what seminarians believed in 1961. Do you believe in a physical resurrection? 44% said no. Do you believe in the virgin birth of Christ? 56% answered no. Do you believe in a literal heaven and hell? 71% said no. Do you believe in the deity of Christ? 
89% said no. Do you believe that man is separated from God by birth, which is the doctrine of depravity? 98% said either no or they weren't concerned about this. And do you believe in the second coming of Jesus Christ? 99% of seminarians said no. Now these are the pastors of churches that are functioning today in America. And that's what they don't believe. Quite a contrast to what we have here, isn't it? I think we ought to take it at face value. History, so Christianity teaches, is not sound and fury signifying nothing, as the barbarians had believed. And as many believe today, that history just doesn't make any sense at all, it's just a hodgepodge, nor is it a weary repetition of cycles as the Greeks had regarded it, or we might add as Hindus regard it. It had a beginning and a creative act of God and it moves toward a culmination determined by him. Kenneth Scott Latteret is a foremost historian of the Christian church. Now, so what? What should be the impact of chapter 1 on us as we read it? First of all, I think it should assure us that God has revealed what he wants us to know about the future. The very second word in the chapter is revelation. Now that means an unveiling. The Greek word is apocalypsis. You're recognize the connection there between our word apocalypse end times things to come it's a revelation now if God gave us something that was revealing something it needs to be understood and can be understood it's not a mystery now there are some things difficult to understand in the book of Revelation many things difficult to understand and I don't profess to understand them all, but as we come to the book of Revelation, we have to realize that this was meant for our understanding, not to be some mystical puzzle. Several years ago, when I was uh, teaching Revelation, uh, a lady in the class uh, had a visiting relative who was visiting from another state that Sunday. And uh, after the lesson was over, she said to her friend, the lady in our church, she said, my, never, my pastor never preaches on the book of Revelation. I'm going to ask him why. <laughs> and uh, so she went home and she asked her pastor, and she said, I have the faintest idea what it's about. Well, this is supposed to inform us what it's about. <coughs> So we shouldn't throw up our hands and say, this is incomprehensible. It was given for us to understand. Much of it will not be entirely clear until it happens. But much of it can be understood as we look forward to what is predicted. Second, it should encourage us to believe that Jesus Christ will return to the earth one day. I took a psychological test one time, and one of the questions was, do you believe Jesus Christ is coming back to the earth? And it was obviously designed to identify somebody who was wacko. Guilty as charged. 99% of pastors don't believe he's coming back. It should strengthen our belief that God will, can and will balance the scales of justice in the future. Now this is tremendously encouraging. So as we study the book of Revelation, we will be encouraged because we are going to see that all the corruption 
and the downward trend in our society in many respects is going to be fixed one day. Jesus wins. And uh, we should learn that from the first chapter of Revelation. Now chapters 2 and 3 we are going to pass over because we could make an entire eight week study out of these chapters and have in the past as a matter of fact but uh, they have to do with things that are presently happening among the churches of Jesus Christ they were happening in John's day they're happening in our day you're probably familiar with these uh, letters since you're a well-taught group of people and uh, we're not going to get into that at all in this class but we are going to concentrate on the future as Yogi Berra said, the future ain't what it used to be. <laughs> and, uh, we'll see that that is really true. <laughs> so let's get into uh, these chapters. Greg Beal has written, the pastoral purpose is to assure suffering Christians that God and Jesus are, are sovereign and that the events that the Christians are facing are part of a sovereign plan that will culminate in their redemption and the vindication of their faith through the punishment of their persecutors. So that's, that's the benefit of uh, really all of Revelation, but especially these two chapters. Now as we get into this section of the future, Chapter 1 dealt with something that John saw in the past. Chapters 4 through 22 deal with what he saw that will happen in the future. Chapters 2 and 3 dealt with what he saw happening in the present. But as we get into the future, it's helpful to orient ourselves with a big picture. So chapter 1 deals with the past. Chapter 2 deals with what's happening in the churches. And then beginning in chapter 4, we begin to move into things that are beyond our time. That uh, after the church is taken away, uh, things will unfold quickly by God. He will bring things to pass and... Uh, we read about these three basic time periods in the book of Revelation. Tribulation, chapters 4 through 19, the millennial or a thousand year reign of Christ in chapter 20, and then the new heavens and the new earth in chapters 21 and 22. Now where does the church fit into this? Uh, some believe that the church will go through the tribulation. Um, I personally don't believe that, and I'll give you some reasons in a minute, but uh, I think it happens before the tribulation. Uh, here are the reasons. It seems to me as I read the New Testament and the Bible that uh, two comings of Christ are in view. Uh, there is a coming when he calls believers to himself out of the earth. That's commonly referred to as the rapture. Rapturo, the, Greek, the Latin word for caught up. But there's a second coming as well. And at that time, Jesus Christ is going to return to the earth and stay here. Stay here for a thousand years. Personally, physically, visibly, tangibly. Um, the rapture is imminent. That is, it could happen at any time. But the second coming is not imminent because the tribulation has to come before Christ returns to the earth to settle here and reign for a thousand years. Now there's a great deal of misunderstanding among Christians generally about the word imminent. Imminent does not mean that it's going to happen soon. It means that it may happen and could happen very soon. It's impending. We talk about imminent danger. 
That's danger that could happen at any time, but may not happen for quite some time. See? So as we talk about imminency, make sure that we're uh, understanding it that way. The rapture could take place this afternoon. We could be in heaven with the Lord this afternoon. There's no predicted event that has to take place before the Lord calls his own to himself. But a great tribulation is coming on this earth, one that is worse than anything the world has ever seen, the prophets tell us. And then the Lord will return and reign. The rapture is a secret event in that uh, the world in general will not anticipate it, will not, what, will not know what happened when it takes place. But when Jesus Christ comes back to the earth, it's going to be known by every person on the earth. We read that in chapter 1. Every eye will see him. When Neil Armstrong landed on the moon, it's uh, been estimated that 25% of the world's population saw that event. And that was, what, 61? Today, uh, with, with uh, the, uh, whatever it was, <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> but uh, today, it's possible that everybody in the world could see an event that was happening. And that's going to happen when... Jesus Christ comes back. Uh, the rapture will be an instantaneous event. We'll be caught up together with the Lord in an instant and the blink of an eye, Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians. But his second coming is going to be a gradual thing in that people are going to see him descend, the prophets tell us. The rapture is going to take place before God pours out his wrath on humanity. The second coming is going to occur after this great tribulation. And uh, there are scriptures um, supporting each one of these. If you turn to the back of your handout, you'll have the, some of the scriptures that uh, you can refer to in, uh, for further study with that. Well, we're going to have to stop there this morning, but uh, we'll pick it up at this point with chapter 4 next week, and uh, let's have a word of prayer as we close. Father, we thank you for revealing your Son, Jesus Christ, to us. We thank you that we have seen him by faith, we have come to trust in him and believe in him but we know that we are going to one day see him face to face and that could be today and we pray that you will help us to live each day in the light of the imminent appearing of our savior we thank you for this revelation we pray for your guidance we know that even though you have revealed it, uh, our sinful, limited condition makes it difficult for us to understand much of what you have revealed. And we pray for insight. Uh, we pray for wisdom. And we thank you that your Holy Spirit has given us to lead us into all the truth. In Jesus' name, amen.